Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming along, and I hope you enjoy the talk. My name is Fraser MacDonald, and I'm the Program and Engagement Coordinator for South Ayrshire Council. And I've been based there at Roselle House, which you can see in this image since kind of mid-2022. Um, so I'm going to speak a bit about some key artworks in our collections and some additional artworks that we've also got, and also some artworks by artists in this discussion, just to illustrate some some of their other works. I'm also going to recite a very brief bit of poetry in Scots, so bear with me on that one, please, and also give you a little bit of history about um, Rizal as a property as well. Um, so I'll just go through these three images in the opening slide to give you a little bit of a flavour of Rizal itself. The three images in the opening slides are of Rizal House Museum and Galleries in Rizal Park in Ayr, looking splendid in the summertime last year. Rizal House is a Georgian villa, and on site we also have the McLaurin Galleries which holds its own collection and distinct programme. South Ayrshire Museums and Galleries also have the McKechnie Institute in Girvin, which is slightly further south, and it has its own museum, gallery, and beautiful gardens as well, which is very specific to the history of Girvin. In 2022, we opened the Heritage Hub in Ayr Town Centre, um, which tells you a little bit more about the history of Ayr through the ages, um, going back through the centuries. Um, and for the talk, I'm going to focus more on Roselle House with works both from the Roselle collection and one work from the McLaurin Gallery collections as well. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about Roselle House itself. Um, a gentleman called Robert Hamilton, the son of the air merchant Hugh Hamilton, travelled to Jamaica in 1734 to work. And within a year, he'd acquired co-ownership of the large sugar plantation of Roselle in Pemberton Valley by marry marrying the widow who possessed them both. In 1744, Robert returned to Scotland with his family and took up residence at Bowtree Hall near Irvine, which he eventually purchased. And Irvine's about 30 miles or so north of where we are at Roselle House. Um, Robert continued to run the Jamaica um, sugar, sugar operations through overseers on the island. And then when Ayr Town Council sold the lands, which made up the barony of Alloway, where Roselle is based, in 1754, Robert Hamilton purchased a large part of it to form a new estate, which he named Roselle. And he had Roselle House built there in 1760. Robert then died in 1773. His Hamilton relatives continued to be involved in sugar production in Jamaica until the emancipation of slaves in the British West Indies in 1834, and at that time, the Pemberton Valley Plantation as well. Uh, there's an excellent book by a journalist and author, Alex Renton, titled Blood Legacy, that came out, I think it was published in 2021, that touches on some of Alex's um, family history, but also some of the history of Roselle via the story of his own family's involvement in Jamaican estates. Um, I'll move on now quickly to a wee bit of history about the McLaurin Gallery. Um, the McLaurin in the courtyard that you can see in this image, the McLaurin Galleries make up the, the old stables in Roselle House uh, and have a series of five beautiful galleries and we kind of share the site together. So we've got quite a diverse programme at all times, which is fantastic. Um, so the McLaurin Trust was established following the bequest of Mrs. Mary Ellen McLaurin, who died in 1971, and who wished to have an art gallery or museum erected within the Royal Borough of Ayr in memory of her husband, James Henry McLaurin. And the McLaurin Gallery subsequently opened in 1976. And McLaurin had a fantastic collection from the outset, um, which is a slightly more contemporary collection, the South Ayrshire Fine Art Collection. So they complement each other really well. And we do, do a lot of kind of co-produced shows together with um, a real celebration of both collections. Uh, moving on, we're going to go to our first actual focus artwork. Um, and it's from the South Ayrshire Collection and it's titled The Pleasure Beach. Uh, it's a work of acrylic on canvas by an artist called William Drummond Bone. William Drummond Bone was born in Ayr in 1907 the nephew of the artist Muirhead Bone. We'll come back to Muirhead Bone later on in the talk with a connection to an exhibition. Um, William graduated from Glasgow School of Art in 1931, and in 1934, he was appointed a member of the teaching staff in the School of Drawing and Painting. At the outbreak of World War II, he first saw active service in France and later in Germany, before returning to take up his teaching post in the Glasgow School. In 1948, he was appointed senior lecturer in charge of first and second year student studies, and he worked there until his retirement in 1971. This work shows the low green park in Ayr, done by the beach, and it also shows the Ayr Pavilion, the building that you can see, um, which was constructed in 1911. In the background, you can see a kind of distant view of the Isle of Arran, which is part of North Ayrshire, but you can see from pretty much any location in South Ayrshire. 
Um, the building, the pavilion, is is still in use. It's currently uh, an adventure park kind of for children. Um, but there's been many things over the years and is very well known by residents of Air and beyond. Um, in most recent decades, it was a music venue, or has been different music venues, but possibly most famously, famously a music venue called Hangar 13, which was at the forefront of the Scottish rave scene, as well as hosting bands, including Iron Maiden and Faith No More. This painting was commissioned by British Railways as an image to promote pleasure steamer cruises during the summer, um, which is on an image in our next slide, which I'll just move on to. We've got numerous travel posters in our collection, mostly all on permanent display in Air Heritage Hub, the, the, the Heritage Hub that we opened in 2022 in the town centre. Um, the images are being used more and more across train stations as well in Ayrshire and beyond. I've seen them pop up more across Scotland as well, among many other commissions from different parts of Scotland. Um, being in the southwest of Scotland and having so many seaside towns connected by rail, we are an extremely popular area for visitors, even those from central Scotland looking for a bit of winter, summer, spring or autumn sun, or indeed any sun at all when it does shine. Um, railway posters started in the late 1800s as a way of rail companies advertising their new routes, and this coincided with the surge in industrialisation, people having more disposable income and a consequent increase in holiday making. Um, it also coincided with the development of the lithography printing process, which allowed for the mass printing of such large format images. Um, and we're delighted that we've still got some in fantastic condition in the collection and they look so good framed up. Um, move on to the next work, which kind of is similar to this William Drummond work. This next work is an original, currently unframed acrylic on board painting, also for British Rail, and it depicts a similar stretch of beachfront in air as the William Drummond bone work, but looks back towards the town and further north. This is a photograph of it um, in our collection stores um, last week. Montague Birrell Black painted a huge amount of works for tourism, but was probably best known for a poster that he created for the London Underground. It features a highly futuristic image of London in 2026, which isn't in this talk, but I do encourage you to go and seek it out. And in the poster, the golden evening sky is filled with monoplanes, biplanes and dirigibles. New York style skyscrapers tower over St. Paul's Cathedral and the signs in the buildings have sort of far-fetched futuristic names, including the Gas Company Limited, London Bridge Air Depot and the Mars stores, presumably not the confectionery, but relating to the planet. Illuminated signs suggest traveling by underground to Glasgow in about two hours. And there's an overline Zeppelin line that flies overhead that connects London between between London and Sydney in Australia, sorry. Um, the reason for including this work is the relationship to the William Drummond Bone Works, but also that it will likely feature in a major exhibition that we're currently planning for 2025 across all our venues, using purely artworks and objects from our collection, um, in which we'll focus on the kind of past, present and future of leisure and tourism in the area. Moving on to the next slide. This is one of the feature works from our from our talk tonight. Um, and this next slide is a work by George Leslie Hunter titled The Canopy, which I've got a bit of a soft spot for on account of being, it was the first piece that I saw on display here when I took up post and due to both its scale and subject matter as well. And I've previously been involved in a project that used the kind of BT manhole cover tent, which has got the same kind of design as this. So I've got a real fondness for this work for a lot of reasons. Um, it's likely part of a famous sequence of works that Hunter did whilst living in France in 1914. And as such, it's quite an early, rare and significant piece. Uh, Leslie Hunter was one of the four Scottish colourists, along with Samuel John Peplow, John Duncan Ferguson and Francis Campbell Cadell, all of whom we have worked by in our collection, thankfully. He painted predominantly still life and landscape works, as well as portraiture of both patrons and friends. This work is going to feature in an exhibition with the Fleming Collection of Colourist Works in 2025 at Dovecot Studios in Edinburgh, which we're really looking forward to. It'll be the next time this work goes out on loan, I think. Hunter was born in Rothsey on the Isle of Butte, not too far from Ayrshire. His family emigrated to California in 1892, and by the turn of the century, he was making a living there as an illustrator. Most of Hunter's work was unfortunately likely destroyed as a result of the earthquake in San Francisco in 1906, which then prompted his family to move back to the UK. Hunter was influenced by the pure bright color and loose brushwork of French Impressionism post and post-Impressionism, and was said to have grasped Cezanne's experimentation in painting of composing forms via the pure application of color rather than the composition of figures and objects themselves. 
I'll move on to a slide that features this work as part of an exhibition. Um, this slide shows George Leslie Hunter works the canopy and a piece called Mrs. R.C. Roy that we'll move on to next, beside uh, a work by jo J.D. Ferguson titled Castelleros the Rink. Uh, this is an image of an exhibition from 2022 that was on when I first took up post that was curated by my colleague, um, our collection manager. Um, it was titled Council Treasures and showed some of the key works in our collection because we don't have a dedicated site for our fine art collection, so we tend to rotate works between different shows. Um, we've recently, and we're about to do so again this year, uh, invited staff to go behind the scenes in our collection and make a selection of a work that means something to them to curate exhibitions in a series that we've titled Cabinet of Curiosities. And we have a longer term ambition of doing this with schools as well. Um, people are so fascinated by what's in the collection store and it's been great to enable kind of more access to behind the scenes and get people involved more in exhibition making. We moved our stores to a fantastic brand new facility roughly two years ago. So it's also been a, a great way of giving people kind of better access to our stores. Um, and also the fact that, you know, public collections are owned by the public. So it's nice to get them involved in selecting and curating exhibitions too. Um, this next slide is our work of a, it's a painting titled Mrs. R.C. Roy, also by George Leslie Hunter, and gives a good idea of what his portraiture work was like. Um, Jessie Service McPhee, which was her maiden name, was born in Partick in Glasgow in 1891, and she married a butcher named Robert Crawford Roy in 1921. They moved to Glasgow not long after to Ayr and lived in Ayr for some years at a place called Beresford Terrace, just along from a, the road from an artist called jo, uh, Thomas Bonner Lyon. Jessie then died in 1954, age 62, and this painting is dated around 1926, I think, making her probably 35 at the time of sitting. And we can assume that a series of drawings that we've got by Leslie Hunter of her husband, Robert, were created around the same time as this that we've got in her collection too. The executor of the Roy's estate was a friend of theirs um, called Dr. Tom Honeyman, who was director of Kelvin Grove Museum and Galleries in Glasgow at the time, and a friend and sitter for Leslie, Thompson, uh, for Leslie Hunter as well. Dr. Honeyman worked with the Royals to ensure works such as this made their way into public collections. And he was instrumental in securing the gift also from Sir William Burrow for the Burrow Collection in Glasgow, which recently reopened and I think won Museum of the Year last year. If you've not gone to see the Burrow Collection, it's, it's well worth a visit. It's a lovely place to spend time in a fascinating redevelopment of the building. Now the next work I'll move on to relates very specifically to our location in Alloway. This piece is called An Unku Site by Alexander Gowdy. Um, and it's one of 54 Tam O'Shanter paintings that we own by Alexander Gowdy, painted to depict Robert Barnes' famous Tam O'Shanter poem. For those of you that don't know, Tam O'Shanter is a narrative poem written by Barnes in 1790 while he was living in Dumfries. It was first published in 1791, and roughly, I think it's 228 lines long, is one of Barnes' longer poems and employs a mixture of both Scots and English language. If you've ever been to a Barnes supper, you're possibly more familiar with his address to the Haggis. Uh, and if you ever get the chance to go to a Barnes supper, I would highly recommend it, and maybe even take on the address to the Haggis yourself if you're feeling brave. I've never done it. The upstairs, the upstairs of Roselle House, um, to tell you a little bit more about the house itself and the fact it relates to this work quite specifically. Um, the upstairs is dedicated almost entirely to the work of Robert Burns, with numerous items relating to him alongside the majority of the Alexander Gaudi paintings. And this is because we're in a Robert Burns hotspot here, of course, with his birthplace, Burns Cottage, just along the road from Roselle House, and the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum just across from it, which is National Trust for Scotland property. Um, Alloway Kirk, in which this painting is set, is just a short walk from Roselle House too. It's only about two minutes down the road from here. Uh, and it's on what, what we've set up a couple of years ago for, called the Blue Bonnet Trail, which links some key locations in Robert Barnes' work, and particularly Tam Shanter. Um, the painting itself depicts the chaotic and shocking scene that Tam beholds once he has approached the Alloway Kirk. This refers to the below section of the Tam Shanter poem, which is full of vivid imagery and which I am about to recite to you. Apologies in advance. And vow, Tam saw an unku sight, warlocks and witches in a dance, nay cotillion, brent new free France, but hornpipes, jigs, strathspeys, and reels, put life and metal in their heels. A winnick bunker in the east, there sat old Nick in shape obese, a towsy tyke, black, grim, and large, to gie them music was his charge. He screwed the pipes and gart them skirl, 
till roof and rafters added dirl. Coffin, coffins stood around like open presses that showed the deed in their last dresses, and by some devilish contrape slight, each in its cold hand held a light. Now, this is one of few passages from Tama Center, but if you've not read or seen the poem, um, maybe seek it out online being performed by somebody who can actually do proper Scots, and I would highly recommend it. It's great to listen to. Um, in the painting itself, you can clearly see in the top left the devil glowering in the back left corner with bagpipes in his hand and mouth, casting a huge shadow in the back wall with witches and warlocks in a dance spinning each other around. The numerous coffins encircling the dancers with their skeletons holding candles as light as well. There is nakedness, there is sorcery going on at the table, and the full moon can be seen through the window, and the party goers are of course oblivious to Tam's presence in the left-hand side window. We now host an annual performance of actors portraying scenes from Tam Shanter in Roselle House, and they're presented alongside a selection of the gallery works, which is extremely popular as an exhibition and performance. It takes place in October, with, of course, some dedicated performances on Halloween, and we try to pitch it as family friendly, although it does get a wee bit scary sometimes. We'll move on to a very different work. Um, this work is a piece from our collection titled Working Model for Draped Reclining Figure, uh, which is a, one of nine in an edition. Uh, and it's, of course, by Henry Moore. You're probably familiar with his work. Um, this work was purchased in 1979 following a visit by a local councillor to Moore's studio. And it's been on permanent display at Roselle House ever since, although it does sometimes change location to accommodate program. In 2022, we commissioned an object handling kit made by the artist U.S. Corrigan, who's based in Edinburgh, to show the different stages of the mold making process from casting and finishing process involved in making bronze works. Um, so we display the object handling kit alongside this works at all times, alongside a film of the casting process as well. And it's been particularly popular with Kind of younger audiences and schools audience to get a real handle on what materials would have been used um, from the kind of conception to the finishing of a work like this. Um, this mood is one of very few in collections across Scotland um, with more of his works being of course as foundation and sculpture parks across England um, which if you've not been to it, are also well worth a visit fascinating places. Um, Henry Moore developed a distinct style that was uniquely his own. He came to the visual language through the intense study of art from across history and global cultures. Um, and from the early 20th century, in progressive artist, artistic circles, there was an increased interest in antiquities and art from Africa, Asia, Oceania and the Americas. And Moore, like many of his contemporaries, drew inspiration from these cultures. Through Moore's work, the global sources of modernism were really laid bare. In his lifetime, Muir became the most famous British artist, recognised around the world for his sculpture. Whilst known principally as a sculptor, he experimented in various mediums, including drawing and printmaking. He persistently revisited a few key subjects, though, namely the mother and child, the reclining female figure, and the seated figure. Henry Muir was born in Castleford in Leeds in 1898 and studied at Leeds College of Art and then the Royal College of Art in London. He relocated from London to Perry Green, Hertfordshire during the Second World War, where he lived and worked until his death in 1986. He was also a war artist too. We're going to our next slide. It shows you the, the, the work in context of an exhibition titled Threads of Influence that we did with Sainsbury Centre in Norwich in 2022. It also shows the work just behind the head of the draped reclining figure titled Sculptural Objects, um, which we borrowed from Dundee University Collections, as well as a piece in the wall titled Animals in the Zoo that we borrowed from the Sainsbury Collection. Uh, and I'll just tell you a little bit more about those works. Um, the Sculptural Objects print, um, the print just behind uh, the draped reclining figure there, is from a series called School Prints, which ran from 1943 to 1949. School Prints was realised through the passion and persistence of Brenda Ronsley, her husband Derek, and the critic at the time, Herbert Reed, who quite rightly believed that education through art is education for peace. It was set up with the aim of supplying original, high-quality contemporary art to schools so that children, regardless of their background, could experience good art. It was a wonderful project that involved artists involved, uh, including Matisse, Lowry, Georges Braque, Picasso, and of course, Henry Moore. And I'll, I'll move on to tell you a little bit about this exhibition specifically. Um, as a student, Muir was told to study exhibition, uh, sorry, examples of classical art in the v &A. However, he spent most of his time in the British Museum instead, observing the African, ancient Egyptian, Mexican and Oceanic sculpture. As he encountered these objects removed from their original context, he responded to their aesthetic qualities rather than the cultural relevance, often appropriating their styles blatantly and directly into his own work. He found certain subjects, such as the mother, mother and child, possessed a powerful symbolism that transcended geographical and cultural boundaries. 
It's been a universal theme from the, from the beginning of time, he said, and he believed that its representation offered a universal form that anyone could appreciate. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Europe, there was a growing interest in acquiring antiquities and material culture from around the world, in part led by artists, um, and colonialism, colonialism sorry, enabled the widespread movement of these artifacts, result, resulting in their placement in European museums and private collections. Later in his career, Henry Moore himself amassed a large collection of antiquities and art from across the world. Move on to show you this map that we commissioned in 2022 as part of the Henry Moore Threads of Influence exhibition. Um, it's by an illustrator called Ailey, Ailey Muldoon and is freely available now at Roselle House and the McLaurin Galleries. Um, and the reason for commissioning it was to also show that the Henry Moore work is on permanent display in Roselle House. Uh, in the back, there's the usual kind of map information about tea rooms and such alike, which we have here on site and just contribute to the overall kind of day out feel of the place, which is great. Um, moving on to our next specific work, though, this is a piece um, from the McLaurin collection um, called NYC Pretzel um, times three, which is a screen print and cardboard by Clays Oldenburg. And this work is from the McLaurin collection, um, which is based in the, in the courtyard galleries of Roselle House. Um, it's one of, if not the only Clays Oldenburg work in a public Scottish collection, and one of few in the UK. It complements a series of multiples that he made throughout his career of other work of other food related works titled Big Potato, Knackerbrod, and Profiteroles. Pretzels is a screen print and laser cut cardboard, and it's in keeping with the old, uh, Oldenburg's desire to get people accustomed to recognizing the power of objects. He collaborated with his wife, the artist Kusha von Bruggen, and made probably their best known work together called Spoonbridge and Cherry, which is on display at the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden at the Walker Arts Centre. There's a high chance you'll have seen some of the work online before, um, but we've included two of their works as follows to kind of help illustrate the, the kind of larger scale sculpture work that they've got. It's just an image of the back of the pretzels here. Uh, this work is of drape, dropped cone, sorry, uh, which is in Cologne and commissioned in 2001 uh, by Clay Zonenberg and Kosher von Bruggen, um, which we've shown to school audiences here during talks um, when they come to visit here and when we give them a collection tour and show them some works to help illustrate the other the kind of further career of an artist that we've got in our collection. Um, so kids tend to love this work um, and we've done some workshops around the, this too with the dropped ice cream cone, which is a regular, often tear-inducing feature of a seaside day out in air. Um, we're currently looking at works like the NYC Pretzel, um, though, as being a guide for engagement with younger audiences too, because we're setting up a new print space at Roselle House and the McKechnie Institute in Girvan as well, to enable all audiences to be able to make their own editions of work, um, with their screen printing, lithography, and at the moment we've been doing woodcuts and lino cuts. This next work here, um, Plantoir, was a 2001 work, um, which was commissioned in Portal um, by Clay Zodenberg and Kusha von Bruggen. This one's included um, purely because it's a slight nod to the direction that our programming is going to be taken in future, with a bit more collaboration with our park ranger service and producing exhibitions that engage with the fascinating situation that Roselle House is in, in amongst amazing flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that McKechnie Institute in Girvan is a beside a really important geological um, site in the sea as well. So we're looking at programming, commissioning works through a collection that engage with this, um, but also sort of working on exhibitions um, that engage a little bit more specifically about this as well. And the fact that we're also based in a biosphere, which is an excellent addition to things. Um, this next work is a piece called Crystal Ship, which is by an artist called George Wiley. Um, George Wiley was born in Glasgow in 1921 and first became a sailor and was then a customs officer, but he rapidly acquired a national and international reputation as an artist and sculptor. His work, which he called sculpture, but with the P replaced by a question mark, um, was famous for question mark motifs within his work. Um, he's possibly best known for a work called The Straw Locomotive, which was hung from Finiston Crane in Glasgow before being ceremoniously set alight and revealing a question mark within it. We've got an image of Finnis and Crane as follows that kind of helps illustrate that. Um, the Crystal Ship is one of his many boat, uh, boat works. Uh, it was maybe better known within his boat works for a piece called Paper Boat, which was built in 1989 and sailed through Glasgow, London, Antwerp, Dumfries and the east coast of Scotland, before it then featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal as it arrived outside the World Financial Trade Centre in New York in 1990. Um, it had a steel frame clad in sheets of plastic and gauze velcroed together which opened to reveal a viewing platform, which rose up like a question mark. 
George Wiley said at the paper boat, we used to build big ships like the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary. And I thought we're not building anything of that consequence now. We can only build paper boats now. So I came up with a kind of cock and bull story about an order from the origami line to build a series of paper boats. Um, we've got a version, there's a version, sorry, of paper boat not too far from air in Irvine at the Scottish Maritime Museum as well. Um, I'll move on to this slide, which shows you paper boat hanging from Finiston Crane. Um, George Wiley also worked in theatre, writing installations and film. Um, there's a, a new venue called the Wileyum, a centre dedicated to his work, which is due to open in Greenock in Scotland in April this year, which is about an hour up the coast from Ayr, um, which is where Wiley, near where Wiley lived and, and worked. And it's also importantly around the kind of energy of the industry that his work relates to. Something that he was keen to stress was that his work was very much about the people and the energies of these industries, such as shipbuilding, rather than, rather than a kind of a lamentation for, for the loss of the industry. It was more about the people and the energy that comes from it. Um, this piece relates all the way back to our first slide in, in a way um, that was by William Drummond Bowen of the Pleasure Beach um, because it relates to an exhibition that we did in, 20, uh, in 2023 um, called Spanning the Centuries in which we showed a series of works by Muirhead Bowen who was William Drummond Bowen's uncle of etchings by Muirhead Bowen of constructions by William Arrow. The exhibition focused on Sir William Arrow, who lived across the road from Roselle Park, um, beside the golf course, which is run by South Ayrshire Council on Belisle Park. Um, Sir William Arrow was an engineer responsible for major world famous feats of engineering, including the Fourth Bridge, or maybe better known as the Fourth Railway Bridge near Edinburgh, the iconic red railway bridge, and also the Tower Bridge in London. Yeah, but, uh, he also constructed the Finiston Crane in Glasgow, which is where Wiley's paper boat hangs from in this image. So we recreated these images and had them in a kind of dedicated gallery within the Spanning the Centuries exhibition, which was predominantly about um, predominantly about uh, engineering, but we featured kind of artist responses to some of these engineering feats as well, because they featured in so much kind of pop culture and so many artworks as well. And our last image here um, is another work by Wiley, well, it's a paper boat work by Wiley, but it shows it passing under Tower Bridge in London, which also featured in our Spanning the Centuries exhibition. Um, I realize that's been roughly half an hour, but um, I'll tell you just a, a tiny bit more about what we've kind of got going on at the moment before moving back towards questions. Um, in Roselle Park, we're, we're kind of slowly but surely turning it into more of a sculpture park um, because we've got a series of works, um, a series of works by an artist called Ronald Dray. Um, who we had an exhibition by recently with his artist friend um, Gordon uh, Coburn. Um, we've got a series of works by Ray in stone, very large scale, called The Tragic Sacrifice of Christ, which are on permanent, permanent display here at Roselle. And we've also added um, a series of works by a Gervin based artist called um, uh, David Powell. Um, and that's a story stroll which kind of looks at key figures in literature, past and present, which has been hugely popular. And also work by Hannah, uh, Catherine Hannah, sorry, a young, younger, kind of more emerging artist. Um, a sculpture at the back of Roselle House called Pathways. Um, we've got an exhibition coming up at the uh, McKechnie Institute in Girvan that celebrates the RNLI's 200th, and um, because we've got a lifeboat station at Girvan, so we're going to be doing a kind of saving lives at sea type exhibition with the crew. Um, we've got an exhibition about golf um, that opens at Roselle in summertime to kind of celebrate the open being back here. And we've recently commissioned a series of shop units by a local furniture maker called Clackenwood in the kind of Scandi, um, Solid Oak Scandi is the kind of design approach and it's the kind of first time we'll have had a dedicated product line and also um, artworks commissioned for sale at all our museums and galleries venues. So thank you very much for, for listening to the talk. I'm just going to go back out at the moment and on